Welcome to Church Online. My name is Pastor Lewis, and I serve here as one of the English pastors. We are so glad that you're joining us here on a Friday night. We're excited to be with you. We are uh, observing now Good Friday, which is the day that we remember the death, the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ. And though it is a solemn moment where we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, we rejoice because we know that Christ rose again from the dead and he defeated death, he defeated sin, and he gave us victory in Christ. And today I want to read a passage and it's found in John chapter 3. So I'm going to ask you guys to start turning there. And uh, throughout this series, we have been looking at how God gave us freedom. Jesus came to this earth to give us certain freedoms. And last week, we were able to see how Jesus came to give us freedom from our sins. So you were once held hostage. We were in bondage to sin. We were born with a sinful nature and we could do nothing but sin. But Jesus came to give us freedom from sin. That's what the whole entry of Jesus into Jerusalem was, to say that I'm going to give you freedom from your sin. And today, we're going to look at a passage and we're going to look at the second thing that Jesus gave us freedom. And it's a very well-known passage. Many of you probably know it. Many of you guys probably have it memorized. And we're going to look at this passage, but we're not going to just look at the one verse. We're going to look at a couple of verses and we're going to see it in context and see what God wants to show us through this verse. And this verse is none other than John 3, 16 through 18. So if you're ready, join with me. John 3, verse 16. It goes like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Say that with me. Is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son let's go to the Lord in prayer to ask him to guide us through this passage Lord God I thank you I thank you for this uh, verse God I thank you for these verses here God I ask you to help us to be able to study to be able to analyze, to be able to apply this verse into our lives. God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, because of your love for us, to die for our sins, Lord, to die for our freedom. God, we just ask you to be with us today as we study this. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Well, the title of today's message, if you're taking notes, and I highly encourage you guys to take notes throughout this message, is freedom from condemnation. And I'm going to go slow on this one because this is not a word we're used to. Again, I'm going to say it. Freedom from condemnation. Now, the reason we don't hear this word a lot is because it's not used in everyday, uh, in our everyday vocabulary. As a matter of fact, this word has a specific meaning for a specific time. Now, this word condemnation, when we look at it, really it refers to a court of law. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm fascinated with law shows. I don't know if you guys have ever seen law shows, but I have always loved to watch law shows. I remember back uh, a few years back when I was younger, I, one of my favorite shows to watch was Law & Order SVU. Any SVU fans? Yes, yes, I, I know you're there. SVU fans for the win, right? And uh, I, I remember I used to love that show. I used to love watching the agents uh, investigate crimes and figure out and arrest different people and bring different people to justice. And that was the law part. And then they would transfer it over to the justice part or to the lawyers, the defendants. Uh, and they would, they would argue in a court of law. And in that show, you would have a judge a lot of times who would look at a case and would determine whether the party, whoever it was, was either guilty or whether they were innocent. Now, as I said, I've always watched law shows and 
uh, one of the shows that we actually just started watching, it's not a new show, but it's new to us, was Suits. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that show, Suits. I'm in like the fifth season right now. Me and my wife like to watch it every once in a while. And it's the premise is this young man who desires to be a lawyer, who loves the law, who wants to do good for people. And he finds himself in a place where he can't practice law because of some stuff that he did. And he fakes being a lawyer. That's the whole premise of the show. But basically, throughout the show, you get to see people in courtrooms where a judge gets to decide whether somebody is guilty or not guilty. He, you know, the, the judge usually has a, a hammer or a gavel. I have a little toy here. But the, the judge will determine whether somebody is guilty. And what the judge does is once he gets the verdict from the jury, he will read it and he says that the, uh, the person is either guilty or not guilty. And then they like slam their gavel and they say, uh, when they slam their gavel, that means case closed, it is done, finished, nothing else to add. They are either guilty or not guilty. They can either condemn a person or forgive a person. Now, usually when they find somebody not guilty, they are not guilty of the sin and therefore they are pardoned or they are exempt from the punishment that that uh, crime uh, was, right? But if they did commit the crime, if they were found guilty of that crime, the judge determines them to be guilty and condemns them to punishment whatever that might be, whether that's a fine, whether that's, uh, whether that's community service, or whether that's jail time in prison. Now, this word that we see here, freedom from condemnation, is a word that speaks of the judgment that we will all one day have to face. See, we are obsessed with law. As a, as a, as a people, as a society, we are obsessed with justice, with law, with order, with fairness. As a matter of fact, if you don't believe me, just ask a four-year-old if it's fair to give them the smaller half of a pizza, right? They're gonna tell you, absolutely not. That's not fair. We need to be equal. You need to give me equal parts. You know, I have little kids, so whenever I split a sandwich, I gotta make sure that it's even, like I gotta take out the measuring tape, make sure that it's exactly the same, because my kids will call me out on it. Like she got three chips and I only got, and I only got two. Like how come I have only two chips and she has three chips? And they'll fight all day long for fairness. It's something that's ingrained in us. It's in every single one of us. We desire for fairness. We have a desire for justice. We have a desire for equality. And even as we grow up, the same exact thing happens to us. We desire justice in the world. Even so, like even today, many political parties and many political candidates have built all of their platform, their major platforms on social justice. They want to show that they are for the people, that they care for the people, that they, that they want to provide for the people who are in need, that they want to bring people equality, they want to bring people fairness, that they want to bring people justice. And so they build this platform on social justice. Now there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, justice is the way that it was designed to be. As we learned last week, it's an attribute of God. God is a just God. And because he's a just God, we desire justice in the world. And so many times we ask ourselves, God, if you're so just, if you're so fair, then why don't you just get rid of evil in this world? God, just get rid of the evil. Like, Evil is the reason why we're having such a hard time here. There's evil in this world that has been brought about and we have, we have nothing that we can do to combat against it. So we, we, we ask God and we, we tell him, God, get rid of the evil in this world. And let me tell you, God would like nothing more than to get rid of the evil in our world. This is his whole plan all along. He has a master plan to get rid of the evil in this world. However, he needs to get rid of the evil, but we 
you and I are the evil in this world. I mean, if you think about it, you and I, because of our sins, because of our nature, because of our evil, sinful nature, that we're selfish, that we want to be brought up and put other people down, we have become the evil of this world. And everything that happens in this world that is evil, that is corrupt, is because of people, is because of humans, and we are the evil in this world. So therefore, we have a problem. See, God desires to get rid of the evil in this world, but God also loves us as people. I mean, in this passage, we just read that God so loved the world. God loves us. And yet, He has a, a, a mission. He has a plan. He must meet His justice. Justice must be served. Sin must be punished. But the problem is that we are attached to our sins. Sin is a part of us. Sin is ingrained in us. As we learned last week, sin has us captives. We are slaves to sin apart from Jesus. And because of that, if God were to get rid of the sin, if God were to punish evil, we too would have to get punished. However, as we just read in this passage, God says that He did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world not to declare them guilty in front of a courtroom. He did not come to do that, but rather He came to save the world through Jesus. And as we go through the story, we're going to see how God accomplishes that mission. So if you're ready, I want you guys to write this down. The main idea of today, the big point I'm trying to make is this. Jesus came to give us freedom from condemnation. Jesus came to give us freedom from condemnation. Well, you might be wondering, well, how does that work? How does He give us freedom from condemnation exactly? Well, we're going to find out as we go through this passage here and a few other passages in the Bible. So if you're ready, open up your Bibles, open up your notes, and let's take these notes down. So number one, first thing I want you guys to write down is this. We will all face judgment. Point number one is this, we will all face judgment. See, laws are necessary. I think we can all agree that the law that has been established is a necessary thing. I mean, you look back in history, and even from the beginning of time, in the earliest civilizations, we have laws and rules of society. And the reason why we have these rules is because if we didn't have these rules, our world would fall into anarchy. Everybody would do whatever they would want. Everybody would look out for themselves. Nobody would care about their fellow man. So in order for us to be able to, to care for one another and not have society fall apart completely, we have certain laws. We have laws that have been put into place. And let me tell you, these laws are good. Laws keep us safe. Laws keep us in check. Laws keep us from, from doing bad things that will cause uh, punishment later on. So laws are good things. I think we can all agree on that. And remember that in order for something to be a law, back to civics class, seventh grade, in order for something to be a law, it must be enforceable. Because if you have a law that is not enforceable, if no, if, if no one can enforce that law, then it really isn't a law. Nobody will have to follow that law. Now, the law is enforceable. And I'm sure you guys have experienced that before. Maybe you like to drive to Orlando and maybe you have a little heavy foot and you know that 70 miles on the turnpike really doesn't mean 70 miles to you, right? Like to you, it's like 75, 80. Some of you guys go 90. You get to Orlando in like two hours. Like how fast were you going, guy? <laughs> and then, and then justice is in your rear view mirror, right? You look up at that rear view mirror, you see those lights, those blue and red lights flashing, the little beep, 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 beep thing that, he, that, that they, that they um, sound, you know, and they pull you over and they give you a ticket. That's a punishment for breaking the law. 
that is your that is the way that they show that you are guilty you know you can go to a judge you can appeal the ticket but if you are in the wrong you know you're going to face a judge and he's going to be like you are guilty and condemn you of your sentence and might even tack on more fees right so the law is something that we that we need to have we know that it's something that's necessary and it also serves a punishment now let's take that over into our study because god also has a law and he has a law against sin and it doesn't matter if sin is small if it's like a little white lie or if it's the worst thing that you could ever commit murder or whatever it might be whatever the worst thing that you could think of might be that is a sin and because it's a sin it is punishable by god if god if we have sin in our lives god will condemn us of our sin as a matter of fact the bible says that we will all be judged one day romans i'm sorry revelations chapter 20 verse 11 through 13 we're gonna we're gonna look at a couple of, of passages right there the the Apostle John writing the book of Revelation, he says this in his vision, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, which was Jesus. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, great and small, any, everybody, all people, great and small, they were all there. They were all standing before the throne. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Every single thing that we've ever done is recorded in these books. So nothing that we've done, no sin that we've committed is going to be kept secret. Everything will be brought to light, the Bible says. Verse 13, And each person was judged according to what they had done. See, we're all going to face judgment at some point. And God is going to, in, in the form of Jesus, is going to be sitting on that throne. And he's going to be looking at you. And as we just read in this passage, in John 18, it says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Those people who will not be condemned. And he says, but whoever does not believe, stand condemned already. God is going to issue condemnation on those who are apart from Christ. And be cast away from him forever. Every single one of us will have to face Jesus at some point. Now how you face him is going to change the game completely. See, because Jesus, point number two, write this down. Jesus took our sin and paid for it at the cross. Point number two, write this down. Jesus took our sin and paid for it at the cross. I want to paint a picture for you guys. I'm going to use an illustration here. And uh, these little jars represent a few things. I hope you guys can see these. And uh, I, was a, I used to be a science teacher, so I like uh, little experiments like this. And I want to show you guys a, a little analogy of how our sin comes into our life and how Jesus takes our sin and pays for it. So just like in a court of law, we would either be determined guilty or not guilty. When God looks at us, he looks at us as if we were these jars. So uh, these jars represent some things. This one over here represents Jesus. This one over here represents us, you and me. And this one over here represents sin. Okay? Now, when we, when we face God, in order for God to grant us righteousness, in order for God to say that you are righteous in my eyes, that you are not condemned to avoid condemnation, we need to be clear, we need to be pure, we need to be sinless. This cannot be in our lives. We need to lead a perfect life. We need to have righteousness. We can't even inherit sin from our parents. Like we need to be so clear and clean. And herein lies the problem. None of us could accomplish this. 
none of us could meet the holy requirements of perfection that God has. Therefore, we're all condemned. Each and every one of us is condemned because of our sins, as we just mentioned. Now, let me show you how this would work. So let's say that we are, that we are born, and uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but as you are born, you actually inherit your sin from your parents. And this inheritance of sin is what the Bible calls imputation. Big theological word just means to put on the guilt of somebody or to put on something on somebody else. So for example, because of Adam's sin, because of the original sin, sin has been imputed or has been passed down to generation after generation after generation. So even when we are born, this guilt, this sin is imputed into us and here's what happens because of that we are marked by that sin as a matter of fact i mean you could see that this water changed colors already and the problem here is that even if you wanted to get rid of this sin you know sometimes people say that you know if you baptize a baby you'll get rid of original sin that does nothing for a child there's no power in baptism to wash away sins. The Bible tells us that there's only one way to wash away sins, and we're going to see what it is. But an, our original sin uh, puts this guilt, it marks us. And now, even when we are born, even when we come into this world, we are seen by God as unrighteous. We are seen as somebody who has sin in our lives. And because of that, because of this sin that's in our lives, now we are condemned. So if we were to stand before God looking like this, if we were to stand before Jesus in that great white throne of judgment, and we look like this, we would have condemnation and we would be found guilty of our sin. But as you know, our sin is not only found when we're born. See, as we go through life, we continue to sin and more and more sin comes into our lives and we do more and more evil things and we have more sin and more sin and more sin and then there's some people who sin even more than others right so these are like the really bad people they have all the sin in them and they are just filthy with sin and when we look at it even if we wanted to pour some of this out there's no way to separate the sin from the sinner. We become ingrained with the sin. It becomes a part of who we are. We have no choice but to sin. Sin has become a part of who we are. And we can do nothing to atone for our sins. But, but, I love what God says here in this passage. See, God made a way for us to be separated from our sins. God made a way for us to be cleansed from the unrighteousness that was in us from the beginning. And I love what it says here in John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world. See, God saw your problem. God saw where you were. God saw your hopelessness, our helplessness, our our desire for, for justice, but it just couldn't be met because we were sinful people. He says this, that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, the one who's righteous, the one who's clean, the one who's perfect. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not be condemned, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. See, in God's mercy, he made a way for us to get rid of the sin. See, this is why God came to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus lived a perfect life. He, was, he had no sins of his own. He was the perfect sacrifice that we needed to pay for our sins. And uh, as a matter of fact, First Peter, the Apostle Peter writes in his epistle to, in uh, chapter 2, verse 22, he says this, 
talking about Jesus, he committed no sin. This is Jesus. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus gave himself up. He took the sacrifice. He, he, he made the sacrifice for us. He took the pain. He took our guilt. And this is what it says. He bore our sins. Our sins were imputed. That same theological word, our sins were imputed on to Christ. He bore our sins in his body on that tree when he was sacrificed. That we might die to sin and now live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And see, perfect, sinless, righteous man took our sin. He took our filth. He took our shame. He took our guilt. And our, and our sin was imputed on to Christ. And as we imputed it onto him, Jesus bore the brunt of it all. But even as he took it, he remained perfect. He remained sinless. He remained the Son of God who came to wash away the sins of man. He came to wash us clean of all unrighteousness. He took our sins. He took our shame. And he nailed it on that cross. And he paid for what we had done. He died a death that we deserved so that we would not have to die the death that we actually deserve. And uh, if you're taking notes, write this down as point number three. Jesus gave us his righteousness. Jesus gave us his righteousness. See, if we were, if we were just to deposit all of our sins into Jesus, he would wash us clean, which is great. Being washed clean of our sins is amazing. But even after we had been washed from our sins, we would continue sinning. And what would happen is we would continue to add sin and sin into our lives. And we would just be as filthy as we were before. Just, being, just paying for our sins once was not what Jesus meant. He paid for our sins once and for all and so instead of just paying for our sins he gave us his righteousness and just like our sin was imputed or transferred over to jesus and nailed to that cross his righteousness is now imputed onto us and now we are seen as righteous people before god and jesus came and he lived this perfect life he was that perfect sacrifice that we needed. And what he did was he came into our lives and he washed us clean. And he allowed us to be seen as righteous before God. As clean as snow. The Bible says that once our sins were scarlet and he has washed us white as snow. He has cleansed us of all unrighteousness and when God sees us when he sees our life he doesn't see our sin anymore he sees the righteousness of Jesus in our lives and that is what he sees when he looks at us so when we stand in the presence of God when we stand before Jesus in that great white throne judgment our lives are no longer going to be condemned but instead our lives are going to be found in the book of life. It's a book that is written with our names in it, which is which our name gets added onto there where we believe and we take Christ's righteousness into our lives. But, you know, this righteousness that God gives us, we see this in Romans 3, 22. It says this, Paul writing to the to to the church in Rome, he says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This is not just something automatic that happens to every single person, 
but it's to those who believe in the Son of God. As a matter of fact, that is what we saw here in John 3, 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to, but he, to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him, there's, there's a, a, a portion where you must believe in Christ. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. So church, I urge you, if you don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to give you an opportunity to believe in him after this message. I'm going to give you an opportunity to put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ so you too could be washed white as snow, so you can be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Now, you might be wondering like, okay, but even if he cleans us, what happens if I continue to sin? You know, I mean, I, I'm not perfect. I've, I've made that decision in my life, but I'm not perfect. Pastor Lewis, what happens if I continue to sin? Well, here's the cool part. The cool part is that not only does Christ cleanse us from all unrighteousness, from all of our past sins and our present sins, but He even covers our future sins. As a matter of fact, Romans 8, 1, we read this last week, says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. So no matter if you, if you continue to sin, no matter what you continue to do, you will still be righteous before God. You will still be clean in His eyes. No amount of sin could separate you from the love of God. You are His child and we have assurance because of His righteousness in us that we are saved. And uh, then you might be wondering, well, I, I love this, Pastor Lewis. This is a great analogy. I understand it. But what does this mean for me today? What does this mean for my life? And uh, I want to share with you two things. In light of what Jesus has done for you, in light of his sacrifice for you, there's two things I want us to do. Number one, maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior.